Hello, Raw Beauties. Today, I have a guest who I actually ran into a couple of weeks ago, and we'll get into that story in a minute. I've known her for a long time. She's an incredibly diversely talented individual. Like you have sung opera in your life. You're an incredible <laughs> artist. You're an emergency doctor, a mom of two beautiful little girls. Um, and you also work in cosmetic medicine as well. So can you start off Brie, Dr. Brie, I should, Dr. Budlovsky, I should say. Oh, call me Brie. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and, you know, your interests growing up and how you ended up in medicine? Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, I am so honored to be a part of this and everything that you're doing is so valuable and you have such a wonderful way of having open, positive conversations with, with people in general. So thanks for having me on your podcast. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Bree Bolovsky and I am an emergency room doctor primarily in Victoria. And I also practice cosmetic medicine. So to, um, mostly injectables, things like neuromodulators or Botox and fillers and Belkyra um, or uh, Lipodissolve as well is something that I offer. And I work uh, both in Victoria and in Vancouver practicing cosmetic medicine. Um, I live in Victoria. Um, my, I live with my husband and my two little girlies. Um, and, uh, and you're right, I have a lot of hobbies, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're like hobbies and, but you're really really good at them like you've oh, done photography for weddings and events you even I mean this was years ago now but like you did all of our our beautiful like stationery for one of our raw dinners and it was incredible like oh thanks you know I I feel like my path to medicine and what I've done like everybody's everybody's got so many different interests and I um, didn't really know what I wanted to do growing up, um, and and I loved the arts. I always have, like I've always made art, and I've always been really involved with music and musical theater. And I um, I think in my heart, I really wanted to pursue theater and the arts in high yeah. school, but I didn't I, I didn't have a lot of role models who were in non-traditional careers. Yes. Um I'm um I'm very type A <laughs> and I'm I'm I like tend towards um anxiety and I like to be organized and I like things to be predictable. And so I wanted to kind of have that in my career too, like a career path that I felt I could that I could count on, um, where I could foresee how things were going to go. I really like theater didn't feel like a really stable choice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, Oh, how amazing though. Right. I don't oh know if God. you're, I are also you into theater? always, I always, I mean, I was big into musical theater and singing and I always used to say like, I just want to be a dancer and I want to be yeah. basically like Britney Spears' backup dancer. And my dad I was know, like, but there's no, there's no, you, but no school <laughs> and degree in that. Like there's so much uncertainty. No. Um, I, I always did, did quite well in biology and science. I had great teachers as well um, who really inspired me. And then the main sort of turning point was that my dad was in a, a pretty bad accident when I was a teenager. He was cycling to work and was hit by a driver who wasn't paying attention and ended up breaking his neck and his leg. And um, he's luckily made a close to a full recovery but there were a number of months there where he was in hospital and in rehab and things were really hairy um and we were really lucky with the care that we got and i remember feeling like i was receiving care also even though i wasn't the patient um yeah. there there was amazing role modeling there for the impact that you could have in somebody's life and so i think that that all of those things came together and that's when I decided to pursue medicine but as you've said I've always had sort of a side gig um so something something creative on the side and I've always really wanted to do cosmetic medicine because I, I think it's really fun I'm interested in 
fashion and, and beauty and makeup and, and all of that as well. And a lot of that obviously goes on the back burner when you're in medical school and residency. Um, but I, um, I really enjoy it. Like I feel, I feel like I get to make art at work. So, so interesting because one of the questions that I asked you when I ran into you was, you know, how did you end up moving from emerge an emergency into cosmetics and what was sort of like the, um, turning point for you to start working in, in and you're doing both right now. Like you are in the emerge room as your primary, but then opening up more space into this other world. So mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about that because you had like, both your girls are young and you were on mat leave and then COVID hit and COVID, I feel like COVID was part of this journey for you. Yeah, COVID was, I feel like COVID is a part of so many people's journeys, like positive and negative, but there's, there's, there's obviously so many horrible things that we think about with, with COVID, but I think a lot of people are finding that they're kind of cutting, cutting down on, you know, and they're, they're really forced to look at what brings them joy and what's important and what's hard. Um, and um, for me, I went back um, for my second mat leave, like two weeks um, before COVID hit, working in Emerge full time. <laughs> um, and I had a six month old baby at home and was still pumping like 80 million times a day. And, um, and it was really scary. Um, like I, I love my work in Emerge and I have the, the privilege, um, but also responsibility of taking care of people when they're in their worst moments um, and they're scared and there's uncertainty. Um, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair to say that that doesn't affect me too. Like it's heavy. Um, oh, and I, I yeah. And I felt like I have always wanted to do cosmetic medicine or for many years I have um, uh, because it's it's a very different it's sort of perimedical it's sort of a different take um, on my clinical skill set um, and and I thought by pursuing it and bringing that in I'd have a bit of a bit more balance so when I practice here um, in this beautiful space that smells like essential oils and, <laughs> and I decorate with art that I love um, yeah. I'm seeing primarily women but I'm seeing people come in looking to do something nice for themselves, looking for a confidence boost, looking to participate in a form of self-care. And it's just such a different um, way that I get to, that I get to practice. It's really, it's really fun. And obviously I deal with their anxieties and um, their concerns and stuff too, but it feels lighter, obviously. So I, I really I like the only balance. imagine. I can, yeah. it's not like, some, I mean, I'm having pictures of the show ER, which obviously isn't what emerges all the time, but like you're dealing with insane traumas where you're having to think super fast. It's all probably very stressful. I mean, I would literally die. I would just like pass out. The, my son had a loose tooth this weekend, a wiggly tooth. I couldn't even look at him wiggling his tooth. It grossed me out it, so much. It's different when it's your own kids though. When my kids get stuff, I am, oh man, I hand off. Yeah, that's normal. Like, no, can't Being a mom's a whole different can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I just can't even imagine the intensity of a merge. And then also like having to come home and be a mom. And then I feel like you would just be looking at every single object and every single moment and thinking about the worst case scenario that could possibly happen because you're literally seeing that at work. Like there would be a knife sitting on the counter and you would be like, Jesus, somebody could fall and that could go right through them. Like the possibilities are endless when you're seeing And it. that's kind of my baseline too. <laughs> yeah, right. Which, like I know when you have kids, like everybody kind of goes there, but yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it does feed into that. I feel like doctors um, make terrible patients. You know, like we're really anxious and we think about the worst case scenario, but then on the other hand, we like get weirdly embarrassed about our own health things and like put off seeking care. I don't know. You're like no pap test for me. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, get your pap test. No, she's like, and no, actually, seriously, ever. Yeah, seriously. Right I've been aging. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, so I feel like it makes so much sense knowing your background as to how you are now doing these two things, like knowing who you are as a person, your interests, your fascination and love for the arts, like the high stress of that, that one space that you're in and then having cosmetic medicine to kind of balance out um, the high energy of emergency. It makes so much mm -hmm. sense as to why you would be drawn into this type of work. So full disclosure, oh, I feel a little bit nervous sharing this. The reason that Brie is even here right now is because I went in a couple weeks ago to see her to get some Botox. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> <laughs> I did. And I feel so much guilt around it because I feel like I'm supposed to be this individual who is like so strong in self-worth and understanding like um, that our beauty comes from the inside. But let me tell you, like I had a moment after moving and getting James started at school and work has been insane. And I just looked in the mirror and was like, mama needs some help. Like, <laughs> I just want to do this for me. It's not going to become an all the time thing. I'm not going to slippery slope into like, you know, like the, um, what's it called when, when you like puff your face out and like yeah. the lip injections, no, no offense to anybody who's doing that. But like, I'm like, I just need my if forehead. You're, okay, if you're going to come to me though, I'm not going to puff your face out ever. FYI. No. <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't know. I can say no. I say no 5 million times a day to my kids and my job and emerge. I know, like but a, I see you know? women, I see what a slippery slope it can be. It's like you start with Botox and then you're like, oh, that was so easy and effortless. And, you know, I feel like I look less tired and less angry. And for me, it's, I get this 11 between my eyes and I get into this constant like furrowed brow state when I'm working on my computer, or when I'm sleeping, I do it when I'm sleeping. So I went to Brie and, um, she gave me a little bit of Botox and I'm not going to lie. I liked it. Like, <laughs> like the result. And it is anyway. So as I'm sitting in the chair with her, we start having this conversation that we're having right now where I'm like, wow, wow I feel so guilty. And yet at the same time, I don't judge other women for doing it. But my hope has always been that women can talk about it more like, so that it's not this hidden thing. But I understand why women hide it and why it's not such a conversation piece because there is shame and guilt surrounding it. Like, yeah. And it's so layered in regards to, um, the conversation around it is so, is so layered with a lot of people who have strong opinions on it. So, mm -hmm. okay. My first question for you, we're going to break Botox down today. My first okay. question for you is what the hell is this stuff? Like, what is okay. it? So, so I'm going to get there, but something else that I feel like I really want to talk to you about is is this idea that because you care about your appearance or because you may want to change doesn't like means that you maybe don't have confidence or maybe that you're not a person of substance and you can you can be both like you can be smart and accomplished and an advocate for true beauty and beauty with from within and and still care about how you look for you, that's normal and that's human. And for some people, it might not be the right thing. And for some people it is. And I don't think that we should feel guilty around doing things that make us feel beautiful on the outside too. If your number one focus is your appearance, then, then that's out of balance. And if the reason that you're doing it is because um, you, you know, are trying to fit a mold or you're not good enough or you're trying to create value with yourself and mm. that's not the right reason. But if you, if it makes you feel good when you look a certain way, like touching yeah. up your roots, like getting eyelash extensions, like getting a manicure, everything is a spectrum. Yes. And luckily this is normalizing, I think, um, so that, and there's less stigma associated with it. And we're starting to have these conversations where, you can still be a person of substance and get some Botox. And the other thing is I get Botox too. So like, 
I know I can't frown and it's the best like I I like you know I'm not I'm not scowling at work yeah I you know um you can still yeah. express you can still smile you can still be vibrant um and you can just look a little less angry anyway okay we'll get, I feel like we should get well, back to that I'm so, so much no, no, I'm back here I'm so glad that you just said that because as you're talking, I'm like, I feel more confident than ever before. I spend yeah. less time thinking about my appearance than ever before. And I don't obsess. So it's not like, oh, I saw that, you know, part of my forehead that was getting more wrinkly. And then I thought about it and obsessed about it. And it became like this big conversation around my self-worth. The thing about Botox now is that it's just so easy that you can kind of see that and be like, oh uh, yeah, I think I could use a little help there or I'd like to, you know, uh, soften that. And, and it's so easy that you can do it immediately. The, the area where I feel some guilt and resistance around this still, I think lie, there's two factors. So one, I feel like there is already so much pressure for women not to age from like the time I was probably 24 and I would go into shoppers drug mart or Sephora or wherever. And they'd be like, yeah, like you're starting to be at that age where you can start, you know, using an anti-aging product. And it's like, I'm 24, but we receive these messages all the time. Yeah, so we do. then there's this added layer that it's like, okay, I go and get Botox. And now people who are following me on Instagram um, and who are trying to feel more comfortable in their inherent quote unquote flaws are now like inadvertently because we just do it comparing to me at some level. Mm -hmm. And here I am like smoothing out a part of myself instead of just embracing it. So it's just like mm -hmm. these, these pieces. And, and obviously like at the end of the day, I'm going to live my life and, and do what feels right for me. But I do want to talk about it really. Yeah. And yeah. then there's the other piece as well, which always pops into, <laughs> into mind, um, which is like, you know, it, it's say, I think it was like maybe around $300 or whatever to do the Botox. Mm -hmm. It's like, I spend that $300 on myself. And then another part of me is like, there are literally kids in the world that can't eat right now. Like, should I have just donated that to a cause or to support somebody or cancer or whatnot? And a little bit of me, I've had to go to therapy for this is, mm -hmm. is like, I, I have to remember, like I am allowed to treat myself too. And mm -hmm. I do give a lot in my job and we do donate as a family. And mm -hmm. Like there's a fine line of, of, you know, helping everyone else, but also like allowing yourself some space to do mm -hmm. things that feel nice for yourself. Yeah. These are totally. things that I navigate as yeah. I make a decision. I think the, <laughs> yeah. And there are things that I nav that I navigate too, either as a patient receiving it or as somebody giving it. And, you know, I think everything in life is a spectrum everything has a good side and a bad side. Everything has an argument and a counter argument. And I think that you can make good arguments in either way, totally. for sure. Um, do you, did you ever read Cup of Joe? Did you ever read that I, blog? I ha Well, so my sister's told me about this blog a hundred yeah. times. So and she's so lovely. Yeah. yeah, so Joanna Goddard has been writing this blog just about her life for, gosh, like 15 years now, or something, maybe, maybe just over 10 years. And she's written about um, when she got married and she had her kids and about parenting. And, um, and one of her, she has a little quote about parenting. Um, mm -hmm. good, for, good for you, not for me. Uh, and you can still accept something for somebody else um, yeah. and decide that it's not for you. And I would never want to push these treatments on somebody. It, yeah. I would only have people coming to me because they want it and they're doing it for themselves. And I know like it makes me feel good. And I, and as with you, I'm more confident than I ever have been yeah. right now, you know, yeah. like I feel, I feel great, but I still want to do this. Yeah. And I don't feel like it's because of a lack of confidence. I feel like yeah. it's because like, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Just like it. In the same way that you like getting, you know, some people like getting their hair colored or some people like yeah. investing in a new pair of boots or yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Well, and for all of the things that we do, like if you are going to invest in your appearance and your skin and in like we are marketed so much stuff, like yeah. 
LED light mass and like people drinking collagen. Like there's no evidence that drinking collagen does anything for your skin. It's a, it's a protein. It gets <laughs> broken down into amino acids in your gut and it gets right. absorbed. There's more, there's more collagen in a steak than there is in like a <laughs> collagen shot that you put in your, in your coffee. And so if you're going to spend your money on that and think it's yeah. going to do something, yes then, you know, save, save that money and put it into something that actually works. Right. I don't know. I so, do. Um, I, I also get back collagen. Your, you do? <laughs> Sorry. God. Okay. No, it's okay. I mean, this is the thing. I don't know. I don't know all the, all the answers and it's all marketed yeah. so geniusly that you're like, yeah, that makes sense for my joints and skin and hair that I would drink this like bone broth thing that's put into a I don't know. Anyways. Okay. Let's go back yeah. to the Botox. Okay, so let's, let's what... go back and we will, we'll, we'll talk about all of this. There's so much to talk to you about. <laughs> um, so, so Botox, um, Botox is botulinum toxin, or we call it Botox for, for short. It's all, there's also the brand Botox, which is a neuromodulator. There are a few other brands that we inject into our face to, um, to decrease fine lines and, and it's a toxin. Um, that in nature is created by a um, bacteria. And, and what it does is we, we can, it's then, um, it's now then a purified protein is the pharmaceutical type. They're not just kind of harvesting bacteria and we can inject it into the muscles of facial expression yeah. and it Im impairs neurotransmitter, uh, neurotransmitter release at the neuromuscular junction. Okay. So it, it means that the nerves do not tell the muscles or give the muscle the signal to contract. So it holds our muscles in a relaxed state um, or flaccid paralysis. So we use tiny little doses that we can inject into the muscles. They just act locally. There's no systemic absorption. And by doing that, um, the overlying skin doesn't fold and crease with that muscle movement in the same way, gradually reducing sort of the depth and appearance of, of lines and wrinkles. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about the whole, like injecting toxins into the body when we talk a lot about like <laughs> removing toxins from the body? I mean, th this whole toxin thing is, is a big marketing thing for me. Like that ship sailed so long ago for me practicing medicine. Right. Like every intervention that I do in emergency medicine is unnatural. And yet it can be good. It can be life-saving. It can be safe. Um, uh, it, yes, it's a toxin. In fact, Botox is like the most lethal toxin that we, you know, yeah. the known to man. <laughs> what? Um, yeah, but we use such tiny doses um, that it, it just acts locally. Like there's no evidence that there's any effect on it anywhere other than where in the doses that we use for cosmetic purposes, um, yes. that there's any effect on it elsewhere. It's not detectable in your bloodstream. It's not detectable in breast milk. Um, it acts where it acts. And I feel fine about it the same way that I feel fine putting on makeup the same way that I would say yes to antibiotics if I needed them though that's a little more of a need than a right, than right. Botox. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it depends how yeah you know how things are how things are going with your kids but like um you know I I feel so fine about it because it's controlled and I know what it is and I know how it works and I know where it acts and it's very right. safe and yeah. the and all the research I mean it it feels like people have been talking about it for maybe the last 10 years, but the reality is it's been in use in medicine for longer than that, correct? It has, yeah. So it's um, about 30 years or so for cosmetic purposes. It was discovered in Vancouver for um, cosmetic purposes by an ophthalmologist named Dr. Carruthers, um, okay. who still practices in Vancouver. Yeah, and so she was treating blepharospasm or um, eyelid spasm yes. and found that people had reduced crow's feet and then started testing it. And, and it's now very well studied. <laughs> What's that? Now she has a lot of money. Right? I know. <laughs> Doing quite well for herself. Yeah, I'm um, sure. And, and people use Botox for um, body odor, like under their armpits, for clenching your jaw. I mean, there's tons of different ways that it's being used. Yeah. For Aside. migraines, for sweating under the arms. Actually, some people will treat their, their palms and soles as well for clenching. 
Um, you can use it for um, excess salivation and syndromes like Parkinson's disease. You can use it for migraines. Um, and then you can also use it in a different way for muscle spasticity. Okay. And then what are the risks involved? I feel like with any of this kind of thing, there's always some sort of risk as well. For sure. So there, anybody who tells you that there's no risk with it, it's not giving you the full information. There's, there's risks with anything that we do. The risks are really very low. It's a very safe treatment. And the main risks or side effects are really associated with the act of injecting something through the skin. So um, a bruise, a little bit of swelling. Some people get a little bit of numbness or itchiness. Um, a skin site infection is sort of theoretically there, though we're using sterile technique and, and cleaning the skin. So that would be very unusual. Yeah. Um, some people get some headaches, uh, particularly in the first couple of days afterwards as the muscles are, are changing and relaxing. The big ones that we warn people about are really quite rare. Um, so a bit of asymmetry can certainly happen and is usually correctable. Um, but things like a big eyelid droop or double vision, um, that would be more of a problem with placement or dose. Right. If you're giving too much or you're putting it in the wrong spot. And then, the, I mean, like if you read the, the pamphlet on any medication, they can, it can get really scary. It talks about difficulty swallowing and drooling and stuff. That would only be if somebody was giving you such inappropriate doses in the wrong spot that it, it would be dangerous. So yeah. you need to go to a practitioner who's educated and well-trained and um, has some understanding of it and isn't just kind of winging yes. it in their basement. I, I feel like with anything that you take, there's always going to be pros and cons. As you said, it's like any advertisement we see on TV where they describe the drug and they're like, this can help you with whatever it is. Like, I don't know why Viagra is coming to mind right now. I'm not going to yeah. do an advertisement on Viagra, but it'll be like, here's the benefits. And then at the, end, like the, at the end, they have like the husband and wife, like walking off and they're like, Viagra can cause heart attack, strokes, diarrhea, excessive, like you might not be able to see for the rest of your life. And they say it all really yeah. fast, but like for any sure. sort of drug that has positive benefits also in a very small percent of the population will also potentially have some side effects as well. And anything in life. Yeah. Yeah. Anything in life that's going to have risk benefit. And I mean, as far as the treatments that we use, it's really, it's very low risk. It's very safe. What yeah. would, what are your thoughts? I've been hearing a little bit more about clean object injectables clean injectables. So like mm -hmm. a clean version of Botox. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh -huh. I've, also been hearing, I've also been hearing about clean Botox and I have to be careful a little bit what I say so I don't get a pharmaceutical company yes. knocking on my door. Okay. Um, so yeah, so there, so, so Botox is Botox. Um, the active toxin is the same across all brands. There's one particular brand that right now is, is marketing their product as more pure or more clean. And the way that when they manufacture Botox, it has um, generally other brands have two attached uh, proteins that sort of inactivate it. And then when you reconstitute it, it becomes active. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, but it's, but that's not the active part of the drug. The active part is the toxin, right? The clean Botox has removed one of these proteins from it. So there's only one instead of two proteins attached to it. Okay. The clinical effect is the same. Okay. Botox is Botox. Um, tiny little differences in when it starts working um, like maybe a millimeter or two in the in the area that it treats um, doesn't really change how we practice and how we administer it um, there's some back and forth about which ones last longer which ones are shorter but the the treatment effect is the same the pharmaceutical companies will tell you a few things that 
one, reducing the extra protein is on there means that there's less of a chance that you're going to create antibodies to their product Mm -hmm. and that it will stop working for you. Mm -hmm. The reality is that it's very, very rare for a neuromodulator to stop working because you get a true antibiotic or, excuse me, antibody reaction to it, um, like less than one in 10,000 people treated or so. The main thing is that this I mean, the main thing that I can see, maybe some people will will differ, is that it can be stored on a shelf before it's reconstituted instead of in a fridge, oh. which is obviously attractive. Like I was just telling you, the power's been out twice here today. So yes. if you're if you're running a big clinic and you've got a huge fridge full of your product and the power goes out and you don't have a backup generator, that's a problem. Right. Um, and if you have their product, then that's um, obviously attractive. Um, it, the, the product's great. Like I, I use all of them in my practice yeah. and I find yeah. them all equivalent. The advertising really bugs me because I feel like it's, it's dishonest. Mm. Um, and I feel like educating people about what they're doing um, to themselves is important. And that includes both sides of the conversation yeah. and making them feel like, oh, it's, more natural or it's more pure well using those words makes people think that the other ones are less pure and they're maybe bad for you or you're more and they're the same you know and the treatment effect is the same and so i think that they're trying to get a little edge of the market that maybe would have been opposed to injecting a toxin into your face yeah when they see this they think of it as a little bit less Yes. Like injecting a toxin in your face. You're still injecting a toxin in your face. And it's great if that's what you choose to do. (laughs) But but it's false advertising to call it something different. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think this is a, a big conversation in the beauty industry in general is this conversation about like what is clean beauty and what is not. And there really are no um, strict guidelines or any governing bodies that are really managing the use of these terms. So beauty brands for skincare are saying that their product is clean, but what does that actually mean? What does that yeah. actually entail? And so well, I- and this is a, this is a, ph- these are all pharmaceuticals, like they're, yes. they're drugs. Uh, and yes. so they are regulated by the FDA, luckily for their efficacy. Yes. Um, uh, but you're right in cosmetics in general and cosmeceuticals, there's a lot of jargon used. Um, And um, I mean, everybody's trying to sell a product, right? And if the products are relatively equivalent, like what is going to give them the edge? Yeah. So the governing body is, um, is confirming the efficacy of it, but it's not necessarily managing the marketing of the product. It's not like there's a, ter- it's not like that governing body has said, yeah, you're more clean than the other brands. That's right. Right. So that's, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there, there are guidelines in place for how things can be marketed. Right. Um, but you're right. They're, they're looking at the efficacy and the safety profile. Right. Versus the specific. But term. the more pure or more clean doesn't come from. Right. Interesting. Them. So interesting. I it's love hearing all of it's, this. Yeah, it's the same. And if that, that's what your provider uses, then great. And if that's not what they use, then great. Um, you know, as long as they're getting something from a reputable governed pharmaceutical company and they're storing it properly and they know how to administer it properly and safely, then that's yeah. great. They're all pretty much equivalent. Okay. Okay. So I want to get back to some more like esoteric questions here for you mm-hmm. in regards to Botox and this whole conversation. Mm-hmm. So I, f- I, I really feel like, and maybe it's getting a touch better, but especially in media, women as they age just disappear. They just like fall off the face of the earth. The roles in movies become fewer and more far in between. Like they're not shown in the advertising campaigns. Um, and even though we may know women who are beautiful and stunning and inspiring and, uh, and wise as they age in our lives, we're not necessarily seeing that in media and media has a huge, uh, has a lot of power over us at the end of the day. Um, how do you think we navigate this piece of allowing ourselves space to, to take, 
care of ourselves in a way that feels good to us as individuals, like whether that's getting the Botox or for some women, it's like doing their boobs or getting lip injections or whatever it is to do that while also allowing space for us to age gracefully. And like, at what age do we just allow the wrinkles to start coming and versus like fighting at all, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, that? yeah, I have. Um, so I think, first of all, I think that you can age gracefully and still intervene if that's what you choose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, I agree. There's a huge focus in media on anti-aging and a lot of things are advertised as anti-aging and um, and, and I'm with you. The way that I practice is I try to swing it away from anti-aging and more towards positive aging. Mm. Um, so many women, women, I mean, I see, I see men too, but, um, but I mostly see women. Yeah. Um, I come to me not wanting to look like they're 19. They just say that they want to look more like themselves. They say, oh, people think that I look angry all the time. Like I have RBF. Um, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. resting bitch face. Yeah. Or like, <laughs> I always get asked why I'm so tired or I feel like I look in the mirror and I don't recognize myself anymore. Yeah. And so having sort of an approach that folks focuses on a natural outcome where you look glowy and rested and rejuvenated um, without looking done is the way that I is the way that I practice because mm -hmm. um, I do I mean I I feel as a woman too like I'm, I mean I, it is changing somewhat I think we are gaining more female role models but you're totally right like you know think about like the male silver fox but the like what is the what is the female equivalent of no, that there is none I'm thinking there about, isn't like, one the big news this year, other than everything else that's been in the news, oh, God. like Keanu Reeves is dating an older woman and she has gray hair and it was like everywhere. And I was Have, like, this would never happen. Rolls over. Every other guy in Hollywood yes. is the opposite, right? Yeah, totally. totally. And I mean, I think, I think that you can and you will still age. Yeah. Um, and, and just because you're doing these things doesn't mean that you are anti-aging, but you can have, you can have a desire to change your appearance or brighten your complexion or make yourself look more awake or soften your features if they are looking harsh, um, and to still look your age. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, there's, and I love know, what you said. All of this beginning. is on a spectrum, right? Like, yeah. It's the same as covering up your grays or whitening your teeth, um, you know, or dressing in a certain way. Like, you know, some of it might feel okay to you and some of it might not. And if you want your hair to go gray, uh, then that's, then that's wonderful. Um, and if you don't, then it doesn't mean that you are against aging. It can just mean that you want to make you know present yourself in a certain way or maybe it makes you feel good mm. I love what you said at the beginning about you do you and I'll do me and I'm so curious to know everyone who's listening right now what your take is on this subject mm -hmm. and so please if you don't feel comfortable um maybe posting about it on social media and tagging at raw beauty talks can you send me a dm send Bri a dm I would love to know your thoughts are you on team like Botox do it like do you girl do whatever works best for you or are you fiercely against it do you think that like we should not be doing this I I want this to be a conversation so that we can continue to engage in it so that there isn't such a stigma around it and so that um at the end of the day my my hope is that we're all supportive of one another on our own journeys and of what we are doing to feel the best in our life um I mean, I hope that's what everyone knows that I'm all about. I'm curious, you have two little girls. Yeah. How do they know what mommy does for work? Are you gonna talk to them about it? Like, how do you navigate that conversation with daughters? Yeah, this is, so this is something that I am definitely figuring out how to navigate to. Luckily they're five and one. So 
we don't go there. Like I'm a doctor. <laughs> I go to work to help people. They know yeah. that I work in emergency and hear some of the stories about, you know, the things that I see there and the kids that I meet there. And then they know that I work in a clinic and I help people in the clinic too. Um, and, um, you know, I, I do kind of, I ever, these conversations will obviously develop and evolve and will be age appropriate um, for them. And, and I, just as I've said that I, I feel like you can be confident and feel beautiful and feel empowered and still do some of these things. I, that's what I hope for, for them. Mm -hmm. um, as, as they get older and are teenagers, I know it'll come up and I'll have to address it head on and I hope that as they are young like right now I am trying to teach them their value in the world is not their appearance yeah their value is who they who they are is their inquisitiveness and their their kindness and their um their willingness to learn um and I mean Rose is one so right now she's just like <laughs> learning not Feed to me. throw shit <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but pop, but Poppy's five and, and these influences will come in and, you know, as they, as they grow, then there will be conversations in general about fashion and beauty and appearance and how they look compared to their friends. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, my plan is to navigate, navigate, navigate that God and stuttering over myself um, by trying to instill a sense of confidence in their individuality and then eventually, yeah, we'll talk about it um, a little bit. And I mean, again, as I said, the way that I practice is not but is not doing any crazy augmentations. Like you can't bring in a photo and say, I want these lips. Like, you know, I, you know, that's not what I do. I'll like, I'll polish the diamond kind of thing, but I won't, you know, give you a sapphire. <laughs> yes, um, yes, I love that. And, you know, and, and so talking a little bit more honestly yeah some people choose to do this because they like that the way that it looks or they like the way that it makes them them feel and that's okay um and I guess just like dating um they'll be allowed to dabble when they're like 35 <laughs> <laughs> until then they're in the bubble they're yeah, not I mean, able to do anything yeah it's all reversible too right like all of this stuff is reversible it's like it's not even like a tattoo where you know people want to express themselves with it and it is more of an intervention to go away like this stuff does go away yeah um I you know we'll have real conversations I guess with them about as time goes on about their bodies and their and their looks and all of that as their mom it's also not everything that I am you know like no. Um, never mind that I practice and emerge too, but just because I, this is part of my job, it doesn't mean that this is the only thing that matters to me either. Like I still am out mucking in the garden and going on bike rides with them and they see me, they see me cry and be scared and they can see that I'm like a whole and complete person and that this is just part of me. And Honestly. hopefully it's just sort of in the context of that whole conversation. It honestly sounds like you're doing such an incredible job. And I oh had God, who knows, Aaron? Who knows? Well, we I don't feel like we the none main of us thing know anything. None of us know. That's the thing that I learned when I became a mom is that everybody's just winging it. <laughs> We're just everyone is just winging it. I, yeah. I exactly as you said. And I think that these conversations, you know, it requires a lot of bravery for you to come out and talk about this when it is sometimes more controversial. I know uh it wasn't didn't feel completely easy for me to open up and talk about it either, mm -hmm. but I'm so glad that we are. I'm excited to have other people on the show who perhaps have different perspectives. Mm -hmm. This is what I've always always wanted raw beauty to be about is a conversation and open for sure. conversation. I mean, you and I need to be able to hear the other sides of it. And I need to be able to hear, we all need to be able to hear opinions that differ from our own mm -hmm. and think about them Yeah, and digest them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they can mean something and maybe they just mean something to that individual, but, mm -hmm. but there are going to be lots of people that have opinions about that in this fine. I mean, there are lots of people who are for it too, which is why I get to do what I do. Um, there are a lot of people for it. I know that there are, I know that there 
our audience is honestly incredible. And I've asked the question about this before on our social pages. And for the most part, people really feel like every woman should do what works best for her. Every woman for sure. should do what makes her happy. And exactly as you said, you do you, I'll do me. And you know, that's, that's all that matters. So I'm curious to know as a very busy working mom with two young children, what is your favorite form of self-care? I have so many. <laughs> I <laughs> feel like, like I can pull out my list. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> um, you know, I think it, it depends on the day. Um, and, and it looks different to me depending on where I'm at. Um, self-care when I, when I'm thinking about the term self-care, I usually think about being like a little bit selfish and indulgent mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I recognize, like I exercise regularly and I know that that's technically part of self-care. Um, but when I think about what like, self-care in my heart yeah. and soul, it is something that feels like it's for me and it's indulgent and I feel good. And sometimes that's a date night yeah. with my husband or um, like a glass of wine with my mom and my sister. Um, sometimes it's going out and like, I can't meditate. I think you're amazing for being able to meditate. Um, I have tried and I just, oh, I just have to keep my body busy. So I've learned that I can meditate by working in my garden. Mm, um, yeah, or meditation. Exactly, moving meditation works. For, during, just a side note, during COVID when I was um, feeling anxious, one of our COVID products uh, projects at home was that my husband built a shed and I, I painted the shed and I felt like I would like feel anxious and just need to get outside and do something. And my, when my husband could see that I was feeling like I was a bit pent up and needed some yeah. self-care, he'd be like, do you need to go and paint the shed? I'd be like, yes, I need to go and paint the shed. And I would go, and now we still use that, that term. Do you need to go paint the shed? And I'm like, see you later. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. We all had those moments. Everyone needed a shed to paint throughout the last yeah, year. And I'm exactly. sure, there, you know, there are moments to come, but you're right. Meditation can look different for everybody. Self-care can look different on different days and in different moments, but yeah. I love how you described it. It's like for you, when you really think about self-care, it sounds like it feels really nourishing. Like it's just, it does. And some, sometimes it's actually like working on my website or working for, for this or working on my social media or, and sometimes it feels like something like, I, I love this stuff. It's fun. I like, I get to, it feels creative to build a business and to talk about it and to educate around these things. And, and I enjoy it. And so sometimes while that's technically work, this feels like self care too. Oh. And sometimes I just sit in the bath with a gin. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. So <laughs> sometimes the bath and the gin is exactly what you need. Yeah. <laughs> where, where can everybody find you um, on social? What's your website handle? Give us the goods. Yeah. So on Instagram, I'm at Dr. Bree, um, D O C T O R B R I. And my website is www.drbree.ca. I have a I have a, an untouched Twitter, which I feel like I won't Me even too. mention because I just, I can't, there's too many things, but yeah. yeah, Instagram is my main thing. If you have questions for me, then you can message me on Instagram or you can, my, um, on my website, you can contact me via my website or my email address is up there too. And I'm happy to hear opinions or amazing answer questions or yeah. Okay. My very last question for you, everybody go follow her. If you're interested in it, send her a DM. Um, last question for you. If you were to send an email right now that was going to land in the inbox of every woman tomorrow morning, what would that email say? No pressure, no pressure right? <laughs> no, no pressure. I'm going to sit my tea here Oprah. for a second. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oprah. Yeah. Um, okay. I feel like as women, we are often taught to take ourselves less seriously or we are devalued if we show emotion or have classically sort of female interests or we're taught to kind of sacrifice our femininity if we want to be taken seriously. Yes. 
And my message would be that don't apologize for that. You are a whole person. Even if you really like super floofy things, you can still be smart and driven. If you, um, you know, you are still a whole person, if you sometimes care about how you look or, you know, if sometimes you feel confidence by getting dressed up and sometimes you are most confident when you have no makeup on, like you can be a whole person and be complex and don't apologize for these things that were taught as women make us weaker or are taken less seriously. Yes. I don't know if that was Thank super you eloquent, for that. but it, you know, you I get like I love that five. message. I love <laughs> that message. We can be it all. You can be, you can, you can care about your appearance and also be really freaking smart and driven and, or an incredible mom and not wear a lick of makeup. Like do mm -hmm. what feels right for you. And mm -hmm. I love that message. I don't think we hear it enough, but uh, it has been so fun chatting with you. I feel like we could go yeah. on and on and on and on and cover. Yeah, me too. This is lovely. <laughs> oh, anyways, thank you for joining me. For anyone who's listening right now, if you enjoyed this episode, please send it on to a friend. Take a screenshot, tag at Raw Beauty Talks, at Dr. Bree, and um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bree. Thanks so much. Appreciate oh. it.